we have talked about definitions, different types of definitions. Uh, let's spend just a few minutes talking about imagery. When you're trying to describe something to your audience, there's a variety of ways in which you can describe it. You could certainly describe it with the words, just saying, you know, how would you describe a bottle of water? I mean, what would you say about it? Bottle of water. Transparent. Transparent. So that's one adjective. Give me some more. Now, and try to sound a little bit more enticing. You make me want to, you know, you're trying to convince me to drink more water. Let's say you're making a speech to try and convince me more water. Cool and icy. Cool and icy. Okay. If I'm in Alaska right now, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing. You're laughing because you got cool and icy sounds for somebody who's hot, right? When I'm in Alaska and I'm freezing, I'm like, cool and icy. No, no, I got plenty of cool and icy everywhere. I don't want that. Uh, you know, the opposite of quench your thirst. Quench your thirst. Good. That's something we all have. We all get thirsty, right? So that's the idea of quenching your thirst. So you can describe it with words. You could say it's good, it's refreshing, it will quench your thirst, it's satisfying, right? So you could use all sorts of adjectives to try to describe it to make me want to drink it, you know? Uh, you know, using hot or cold is a little bit relative depending on how I feel at the moment, where I am maybe, right? So we already figured that out. But a word refreshing is good. Because who doesn't like to be refreshed? Who doesn't like to feel that their thirst is being relieved? So that's a, that's a good, that's very general, universal way that everyone's gonna be happy with all descriptions. See how I'm doing, how I'm actually throwing away some descriptions that are not good? Because I'm thinking it through, how would I describe it with bottle of water? Well, I can certainly do that. I could show it. I could say, wouldn't you like some of this water? I could just show you that bottle of water. So I can use visual imagery to describe. What is a bottle of water? This is a bottle of water. Right? And there, and there you go, I used the visual imagery. Now, there's other types of forms of imagery you can use. You can use auditory imagery. If I wanted to describe water, auditory, I could play a, a clip of a falling waterfall or something like that, right? Or a running water faucet or something mm -hmm. to get the idea of water and wetness. An ocean maybe, it doesn't matter. There's a number of ways in which I can describe water in my speech by using sound. Um, you can use it in a gastatory way. Gastatory is basically, you know, you could say how it tastes. So when you say it tastes refreshing and it quenches your thirst, that is, partially a gasatory description, you're saying how does it taste essentially. You could say this water tastes sweet, you know, or something like that. Or you could say it's just, uh, or it's fresh, or however, however you could describe it as, you can compare it to something if you want to. Um, there's a reason why a lot of people who are marketing water use like mountains and stuff like that, because they like want to think about mountains and glaciers, like natural, pretty clean things and stuff like that. So people get the idea, their water may not actually come from mountains at all. <laughs> their water may just come as a reclaimed water, you know, just been purified, that's all. But they're gonna use mountains to describe it. So things like that. Uh, you can use olfactory senses, uh, and that's how it smells. So water doesn't really have to smell, so it can't use that with water example. But with other things, you can use smells to describe things. Uh, you can describe a smell. And you can actually get people to smell it. Their mind, the human mind, will do this. If I am good at describing a smell, I can make you sick. You can actually feel like you throw up if I'm really good at describing a smell. Seriously. I mean, just imagine. You could, you could do that with words. And if people have good imagination, they can actually start feeling like... I need to go to the bathroom, I'm sick, I mean, I get sick, you know. It, it, it could be that powerful. There are some things that are very, very strong, it, and one of the things is sense of taste and smell is very powerful with us. And if we can engage a person's imagination to that level, that's a very powerful way of speaking. Tactile imagery has to do with um, 
you know, how we perceive uh, objects, shape, size. I don't know why water bottles are shaped the way they are, but they are. Uh, you're familiar with this image. This is, this, is, this is very effective advertising, by the way, okay? If I do this, okay, and I draw this, what are you thinking of? You know, that's a bottle. Why that shape? Why not that shape? Why aren't bottles shaped this way? You know? And there's a label, right? And there's a little more for you, right? You know, why Coca-Cola bottles just started using that shape, that kind of shape like that? Why did they start doing it? You got it, thank you very much. I was hoping you would bring that up and I wouldn't have to do that. It is seem similar to a female body shape. So all the guys unconsciously want to drink Coke just because it's shaped the way it is and Sprite and everything else, you know. That doesn't look so much like a female body, it's just, you know, plain, right? No curves. So there's a reason why, there's a reason why. And believe it or not, these marketing guys get paid big bucks because they know what they're talking about they know what they're doing so essentially uh, this is tactile imagery in its use and uh, there's a kinetic imagery which really has to do with more of how things you know feel to you you know touch and feel kind of ideas and then there's uh, an organic imagery as well um, that one is a little bit less used <laughs> but you can describe things in a variety of ways you can have the sound, right? You can have the smell, or you know what? If you want to make people thirsty, you just do this. <sighs> See me doing that <sighs> part? Right there, made everybody want to take a drink too. Mm -hmm. uh, just, if you're thirsty and I'm doing that, man, you just got 10 times thirstier. <laughs> That's what your mind does to you. It suggests. Hey, I want that feeling. What he's feeling right now, I want to be feeling. So you automatically say, I want to take a drink too. So you can describe things, you can show things, you can demonstrate things. These are all powerful ways of speaking, okay? And certainly water bottles, you know, can be used as a visual aid if they need to, as an example. But a metaphor, metaphor, uh, is the next part that we want to talk about. Now, what is a metaphor? Can you explain metaphor? Anybody can explain metaphor to me. Just in your own words, it doesn't have to be scientific or anything like that. So what do you, what do you feel a metaphor is? Come on guys. Metaphor. What is a metaphor? If you don't know the word in English, you can look it up, I don't care. The point is I need you to understand what that means. What is a metaphor? I'll give an example. Remember, sometimes when you have to have a definition and you don't have a dictionary definition, you can give me an exemplary definition, right? Mm -hmm. What is a metaphor? If you don't, can't explain it to me, then give me one as an example. That would be a good enough explanation that I, should, I can actually figure out if you understand what a metaphor is. Because at this point, I have no indication that either one of you actually understand what the word metaphor means unless you give me something. <clears throat> what is a metaphor? Okay, the metaphorical meaning is the opposite of literal meaning. That's good, that gives me something to work on. I think you understand what the word metaphor is, at least you're trying to explain it to me by a contextual example. Mm -hmm. Now, give me, see if you can give me an exemplary example. Something, give me an example of a metaphor. No. Hmm? No. God, God is a metaphor? 
happen, unless he's real, then he's not, right? Metaphor. Think metaphor. Life is a journey. Excellent. Thank you very much. That is a good example of a metaphor. Why is it a metaphor? Is life a journey? No. A journey is a journey, and life is life. But when we say life is a journey, we're comparing life to a journey. What's a journey? Just want to make sure. What's a journey? What's a journey? Trip, something that you go on to. Good, good. Thank you. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So, so when I say life is a journey, it's like I'm saying life is like a trip that you go on. It's a process. You get from here to here, right? That's a journey. I'm a journey to the ends of this country. You know, whatever. Life is a journey. So when we say that life is a journey, we're using the word journey metaphorically. To represent what life is. That's a good example. Excellent. Thank you. Any other examples that come to mind now that we kind of got one out? Life is a journey. So think about it, you know. So uh, your example, by the way, <laughs> Ms. Young brings up, brings up another another one in my mind. There's a very famous movie in America. It's called Forrest Gump. Mm -hmm. It's about this guy who's just like a simple guy. He's just just an average, or maybe even below average. He's not even so smart. But the movie begins in a very funny scene. This has he's sitting on the bench, waiting for a bus. And he's got a box of chocolate on his lap, and the person sits next to him. And they start talking, and they start talking about life. And he says this phrase which begins the movie and ends the movie. And the phrase is, life is like a box of chocolates. Mm -hmm. You never know what you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. So you know how you get a box of chocolates and they're all mixed in, right? Mm -hmm. Like some are just one flavor. <laughs> but some boxes of chocolates you get, there are like 15 different flavors in there. Mm -hmm. And so how do you know what's inside? Mm -hmm. Without having a little guide, sometimes they put a little guide and they tell you what's what. Like that shape is this, the heart is that, this, 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 and that. If you don't know what it is, you just eat a chocolate and you're like, oh, that tastes like raspberry. Oh, that tastes like this, that tastes like that. So when he says life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're gonna get. What he's trying to say is that there are things that happen in life that are unexpected. You didn't know that that was gonna taste like that until you actually did it, unless you actually experienced it. So he's comparing life to a box of chocolates. Just like he said, you said life is a journey. That's what made me think. He says life is like a box of chocolates. So a box of chocolates is a metaphor for life in his speech, in his, in his explanation. So you guys have heard about light and darkness, right? Light and darkness. That's a very, very common, almost cross-cultural metaphor, okay? So even most people across the world get it. And if I say light and darkness, <coughs> which one is good, which one is bad? Which one would you like to have? Okay? Tell me, light and darkness. If I, if I said, you must choose a side, light or darkness, which one would you choose? And you gotta decide. Which one is, how do you evaluate them? In your mind, what does light and darkness mean? Is one good, another bad? Yes, no, maybe? What do you think? Just, just, just tell me what you think, guys. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm asking you what you think. That pretty much goes, any answer goes, okay? <laughs> what do you think? Life and, life and dark, what's better? Light and dark, what's better? Which side would you choose? Light. You choose light. Anybody choose dark? It has nothing to do with the colors you like to wear or anything like that. <laughs> okay, it's not, it's not about wardrobe, you know? But have, you seen, have you seen Star Wars? Star Wars, anybody? No, no Star Wars, no Star Wars fans? You don't like sci-fi, okay. That example is lost, forget it, scratch it, erase. <laughs> okay. 
light and darkness is a very common cultural metaphor. Um, at least in, a, in the Western culture, and I would guess in many other cultures in the world as well, where darkness is associated with something bad and light is associated with something good. In the movies, when they show a person going to a good place, it's all light and, and pretty and shiny. And when they show a person going to a bad place, a bad moment in their life, it's always dark and rainy and gloomy. So like, if I want to make you sad, I just make it rain, right? If I make you happy, I give you sunshine. See, that's the idea, that's, that's, it's the associations that we have. But I've met people who like, you know, who like rain and gloomy and things like that, that's what they like. But anyway, this is when we're talking about metaphors. Now, you can use metaphors in your speech in a very effective way, again, to do what? To create clarity. But I don't assume that metaphors work the same way for everybody. Make sure that the metaphors that you're using mean the same thing uh, to your audience that they mean to you. Okay, and so that means a little bit, again, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of research, because not all metaphors um, translate, so to say, from uh, language to language, culture to culture. Okay, so you guys gave me some examples of metaphor. Now, you know I'm gonna ask you about metaphors on a quiz, so you might, might as well make sure that you understand what that means, right? Okay, uh, so let's talk about rhetorical frame. This, is, get, this gets a little complicated, okay? Do you think metaphor is dif difficult? Rhetorical frame is more difficult. Mm. This concept has to do with how you approach a topic. So when you're, when you're speaking in front of an audience, you have an option of how you're going to appeal to an audience. You can appeal to them in one of two ways. You can use a value frame or you can use a narrative frame. Okay, A narrative frame means you're going to tell a story. A value frame means you're going to focus on the fact that the people who are listening to you have a particular value that they all share and you're going to make them uh, motivate them or do some do make them do something because you know what that value is okay for example let's say the people that you're talking to are all very money conscious people they're all into saving money. They're all into being good, you know, uh, you know, sort of say good with savings and accumulating wealth and becoming rich by investing well or something like that. And so, you know, all these people are sitting in front of you have that value. Well, you can speak from the point of that value and create your entire speech based on the understanding that all these people in this room believe that. OK, because they all share the same value. Or you can uh, you know, talk about other values. There's these big things in life that people believe in. They accept them as truths. For example, in the Western world, we accept the truth that life is sacred. Life is sacred. You ever heard that? People say, life is sacred. Why would paramedics fight to save a life of a nine-year-old person they will work for 18 hours to do some kind of surgery to save a life of a 90-year-old person. And in America, they'll do that because the value of this society is that life is sacred. Now, in another society, they're going to look at that person and say, nine years old? Sorry, there's an 18-year-old right there that needs our help. Uh, we'll make you comfortable, but we're not going to have an 18-hour surgery to save your life. You've lived a long life. It's time to go. Oh. You see, you go, oh, yeah. You, see, you don't share that. But you see, somebody has that value where they say that 18-year-old is more important than a 90-year-old. So I'm not going to take care of that person. Because you know what? They lived a long life. That's okay. Now, the reason why you reacted the way you reacted is because you feel like that's not right. Because your value tells you, no. No, that person deserves it as much as the 18-year-old deserves it. And that's the difference. So if you assume a particular value in your audience, then you speak from that point of value because that's something that people already believe. They already hold that as special for them. You already know that that's where they are. So then you can build on that. Uh, where at other times, you might not want to motivate a person through values. You might want to motivate them through a story, which is what I just did by telling you an example about a nine-year-old lady who's not going to get an 18-hour surgery. 
because she's 90 years old. See, that made you feel bad. The story made you feel bad. So I could have said, you know, old people deserve just as much care and medical attention as the young people. And that would have been one way of saying it. Or I could have just told you a story about the lady dying over there and nobody cares for her because she's too old and she lived a long life. And you see what happens is the goal I'm achieving is the same exact goal. I'm saying the same exact information. I'm conveying the same idea. But one, I'm conveying through a story. That's narrative frame. The other one is I'm conveying through a value. So if I'm speaking to your values, I do it one way. If I'm speaking uh, by trying to grab you through a story, same value, but through a story. Uh, I can do it that way. So depending on what kind of response I want, depending on what kind of, uh, you know, sort of say, in fact, I want to have on my audience is what I'm going to use. So that's that's frames. That's what we call rhetorical frames. Okay, so these are the two common rhetorical frames that you can use as you are um, building your speech. Um, questions? No? Okay. Creating an atmosphere. Now, you guys understand that an atmosphere in a speech is very important. I, I said that in the beginning of the class, how I try to create a very particular atmosphere in this class. But... Um, you know, I can create a hostile atmosphere for you if you want to. I can make it unpleasant to be in this class, right? How would I do that? How would I create an unpleasant atmosphere in this class? I can start screaming and yelling at you, getting in your face, throwing things around, making you feel uncomfortable, right? I could start using guilt and shame, on you, try to speak negatively, and all of a sudden, I'm gonna create a very negative atmosphere in class. Now, do you think that's gonna help me? If my goal is for you to learn, do you think creating a negative atmosphere is gonna be helpful to me? Not necessarily. I may achieve what I want for a short time, for a moment, but in the long run, I would make you hate this class. And that means you're not gonna to want to study what we're learning here. So you can create all sorts of atmosphere with your speech, whether it be a positive atmosphere or a negative atmosphere, whether it's an atmosphere of learning, whether it's an atmosphere of camaraderie or not. If I want you to feel that I'm friendly towards you, there's certain words that I'm going to use. If I want you to feel that you are stupid, there are certain words that I'm going to use to make you feel stupid or unworthy or anything. The point is, is that as the speaker, you have a power of creating an atmosphere. And there are certain atmospheres that are conducive to certain types of speeches. That's all it is. If you're speaking to an audience that's hostile to you, the last thing you want to do is provoke them and create a hostile environment where they're already mad at you, they already want to kill you. And all of a sudden, you're creating even more problems. So um, essentially, atmosphere is something that... Um, you as a speaker have a control of and and you can do that with words you can do that with words that we're talking about wording your speech in this uh lecture so uh, there's a little box over here in a textbook that talks about double speak i don't know if you know what that means uh double speak is when we um when we mean something but we don't want to say it straightforward okay double speak is when we want to say something and we're saying it, but we're saying it in a roundabout way and indirectly. So like me saying in class, if I am concentrating on this topic and if I am talking about this issue and I've already spent 15 minutes discussing it, the likelihood of you seeing this issue again is about 99%. So what am I saying? I'm saying I'm going to ask you a question on the quiz about that matter. But I am not saying it. Because I never used the word quiz. And I never used the word question. I said you will be seeing it. And you have to take my double speak and interpret it to mean that, hey, that means it's going to be a quiz. So there's a certain amount level of perception. But I'm trying to veil the uncomfortable conversation over quiz by just saying, hey, you're gonna see this again. You know? So 
if I'm speaking about something that I don't really want to come out and say it up front, sometimes you use double speak, where you uh, veil the direct meaning by using indirect words, okay? Uh, now, intensity. As I've already mentioned, the words have emo emotional force to them. And depending on which words you use, it can be perceived as strong word or a weak word, uh, or a neutral word. Some words are strong, other words are weak, and other words are neutral. Let's think of some examples. I'm going to make you guys think. I'm going to make you brainstorm. Okay. Let's think of a word that have, they may have different positive, negative, and a neutral connotation. Let's see if we can come up with something together. Can you think of one for me? Anybody? Have you come up with a word that can have a positive, a negative, and neutral connotation? If I want to make you feel good about something, I'll use this word. If I want to make you feel bad about that same thing, I'm going to use that word. And if I just want to use kind of some, be in between, I'll use that word. What, what, give me, think of something. What can I do? Huh? Uh, the um, adjective word big. Big. To describe a person. Okay, if I say a person is big, that can mean different things, right? Depending on how I use that word, it could be a good thing or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's true. That, that word is kind of ambiguous. It could go either way. Now, give me a synonym for that word that's always big. It always means bad. So think of a word big that communicates the idea of like negative big. Is there another word that you would use to make it very clear that you mean it in a negative way? What, what would be the word? Fat. fat? Okay, good. So if I say fat, that definitely is no good. Why? Because in our culture, we think fat is bad, right? So there you go. And, and how would I say it positively? Very nice way. What would I do? How about this? Oversized. Oversized. <laughs> just oversized. <clears throat> yeah, there's size and that person is just a little bit over the size. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> so you say, well, that could be either, either good or bad. It could be natural. That's always a good word. You're not saying anything bad about that person. Just a little bit over the size. Mm -hmm. just, that one, always negative. Always understood as negative. Okay. Good, that's a good example. How about this? I'm going to show you this. You know this word. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I, if I could talk about a smell of something. Smell could be what? It could be good, it could be bad, right? Mm -hmm. And depending on how I make you feel, I'm going to talk about smell. If I want to make you feel that the smell is bad, I'm going to say this. Stench. It stinks. Right? And here I'm going to use this word. Aroma. How about that? So here I am working at the perfume store. Am I going to talk about stench? No. I'm going to talk about aroma. Right? <laughs> Now, if you don't like the perfume, you might say, oh, that stinks. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you see, smell is kind of in the middle. It could be either or. Mm -hmm. So you can create an intensity with your speech to how you describe things. You can talk about perfume as being aromatic. Or you can talk about it stinking. And depending on what word you use, that both means smell. 
essentially. Your perception is going to go that way. Okay? So, uh, of course, you have to judge it for yourself how intense your language should be in a speech, depending on the kind of speech that you give and what audience, but be careful because you may use words sometimes that will have meanings of extreme negative to people or, or a positive word. So, depending on what you're trying to achieve, that makes a difference. Another aspect is appropriateness, of course, um, because you've got to think about your audience. Where do they belong? You know, how, how do you want them to react to your message? Uh, using a formal language is always a good idea, but be careful with colloquial language. Be careful with slang. Be careful with uh, words that we use that are non-normative, okay? Because they can be either misunderstood or misinterpreted by people. Okay, so imagine this. I'm sitting here and talking with my friends, and I see somebody walk by, and I'm gonna say, Stephen, he's hot. And somebody's gonna say, What do you mean hot? Do you like him or something? You know? And then the journal around me, No, he's not hot, he's cool. What do you mean he's cool? Well, look at him, he's cool. No, he's hot. See, I just use the words cool and hot as a temperature to describe a person, which can be construed in a variety of different ways. One can be construed as a person who is good looking and desirable or something. Another is a person that just looks fashionable or something like that. Hey, he's cool. Look at, look at his sneakers. Look at the clothes he's wearing. Like, all of a sudden, he's cool, right? I want to be like him. Or hot can be understood as an, as an attraction factor. Something like that. So, you see how like we use these words and they're very ambiguous because I'm using slang because I'm using colloquial language and it's not always clear to the other person of how you're using it so it's best to simply avoid it because your audience can often misunderstand what you mean by it so that's a little um, good advice here something else the textbook talks about is using gender neutral words gender neutral words <coughs> So if, uh, what is a gender neutral word? What do we mean by that? How can we use gender neutral words? I mean, we know that in this world we live in, we have males and females, right? Uh, I know that in the society we live in, we have other options these days. But traditionally speaking, we have males and females, and males and females can procreate, right? And the third category can procreate and make more of themselves, okay? <laughs> but essentially, uh, most people fall into one of the other categories, right? So how do we use a gender neutral language? So if I say my cousin, is a fireman. Do you know if my cousin is a male or female? Yeah. He goes male, why? Because it says right here, right? So if I said my cousin Susie is a fireman, it would sound really weird, right? Because she's not a man, <laughs> right? Because Susie's not a man. All right, so you see how this is what we call a gender non-neutral language. So when I say police, Woman, I could say, I was driving down the road, and yes, I was speeding, and this police woman got in my face and screamed and yelled at me. What the difference does it make if it was a man or a woman that stopped me and gave me a ticket and screamed and yelled at my face? It makes no difference at all because I got a ticket, right? But by, scream but by being like that, by saying that was a police woman, I am trying to stress the fact that this was a female police officer. Mm -hmm. So that gives an idea that I am not really friendly towards females, especially maybe females in uniform who have authority to give me tickets. It just makes me mad that women shouldn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. See? So 
So part of character of mine comes out when I start talking about a policewoman, stressing how I'm mad about her. Now, if she was a man, I'd still be mad, but not that mad, right? See, see how sometimes our gender, sort of say, issues that we have within ourselves can come out. And sometimes these are cultural issues, okay? So what, what is a gender-neutral language? Gender-neutral language that would not use that, okay? Gender-neutral language would avoid using words like a fireman or a policewoman, right? They would choose another term. And you could do that with pronouns also. In English language, you can do that with pronouns uh, by speaking in plural. Instead of saying he or she, we could say they. That is how people achieve it, okay, in English language. Now, I realize this is all political correctness and things like that. Maybe you have no use for that. I don't know. Uh, but I think it's a good point that the authors make. In the world that we live in today, we have to be careful because we're surrounded by people to whom these things matter a lot. Even if they don't matter to you, they matter a lot to other people. And we have to be careful and mindful. And um, when we speak to broad audiences, consider that there are some people over there who are actually sensitive to these kinds of issues, where you may not be sensitive to that, but somebody else might be very sensitive to that kind of issue. And so a gender neutral language makes it better, makes it inclusive. Now, I know that English language, for example, has historically has not been a gender neutral language. Everything is man, you know, man, man, man. We have words like, like this, how about this? Word mankind. What does mankind mean? Human beings, right? So a gender neutral person who is, who is, who is focused on being gender neutral, they would say like this. It would say humanity instead of mankind. It means the same thing. But you see, mankind can be offensive to somebody because that implies that the only people that really matter are males. And females are not important. But using the word humanity is more generic. It allows everyone to be part of it. That sounds like it's a man world. So you see, that's, these are all examples of how we can tone down our language and be more sensitive uh, because to some people, this is a big deal. Somebody else might not get offended by this at all because that's not their issue. That's not, they're not sensitive to that. Another person will. And so in a crowd that's big, sometimes you have to just simply uh, be aware of that. All right, a um, few more things uh, and we'll wrap it up. I have just a few, few uh, items over here. Speaking about diversity, you know, the authors actually give us a few pointers that I wanted to read from this book. Um, the world that we live in is very, very diverse. And sometimes we learn the hard way, okay? So um, here's, here's a few good suggestions that they give us of speaking to diverse audiences. Um, one of the first, that first suggestion on page 149 it says, allow your listeners to understand your perspective by casting issues in terms of your life experience. This is very good. Sometimes we can get in trouble by speaking to people authoritatively because we are basically telling them how to live their life or something like that. And that sounds bad. So sometimes by adding things like, in my opinion, or I think, or in my experience, or I did this, or I did that, by, by turning a speech a little bit to yourself, into your personal experiences, it makes it sound not so universal. Because what happens is if the people to whom you're speaking are not in the same place where you are, then that makes them feel okay because you're speaking about yourself and not them. Because if there's an expectation that we're all supposed to be like you and we're not, then it makes us uncomfortable. So speaking from your personal life experience, inserting yourself a little bit into your speech actually allows a little bit more of a comfort to your audience, especially when they're very different from you, okay? Um, so this is kind of how we negotiate these differences. Second example, a second suggestion that they're giving us is speakers should ap appreciate uh, inclusivity in the relational nature being. 
Now, this, uh, rec this is recognizing that the words of other acknowledgement of their relationship to us and valuing their contributions to our lives. Uh, this is another way of, sort of say, acknowledging diversity and mitigating the differences. Sometimes, when you're giving a speech, it may be prudent for you to recognize somebody else who does not agree with you, especially if you're giving a speech on a controversial topic, especially if you know if there are people in the audience who do not like what you have to say. You might have to give them something to hold on to, to say that, hey, I know I have an opinion, but I'm not gonna stand here for 15 minutes and load my opinion on you. I want you to recognize that I also know the opinion that you hold, which I do not share, but you hold it. So I'm going to quote somebody, I'm gonna cite some guy, I'm gonna make a reference to, to that other point of view, okay? And be inclusive about it. So I do not sound like as if my way is the only way. Because there are other ways. Yes, I am speaking about my way. I'm not gonna change my topic. But I'm going to recognize that there's another way. You see what I mean? And by doing that, you're including some of the people in your audience, especially if they're very diverse and they're very different from you. You're creating a way for them to still connect to your speech, even if they disagree with you from the beginning. But you're giving them something. You're giving them some room to agree with you. At least they can agree with you on that, on what you just said, which articulates their position. That they can agree with. You see what I mean? You're giving them something positive. So that's, uh, that's a technique. A third technique that they're talking about this is empower others. So to empower others is to share the risks and responsibilities, common goals with them. Uh, you can do that in speech. You can empower people in speech. I try to empower you in my class all the time by giving you an ability to speak, by giving you chances to drive this class, by giving you a chance to come up with examples that we talk about and illustrate with. That is me giving the power to you I want you to have that power because I actually believe that in a learning environment, it works that way better. Uh, other people may not feel as comfortable about it. So when you ask for people an opinion or something like that, when you're trying to poll your audience as you're speaking, you gotta realize it might not work out the way you want it to, but you are giving them the power and you have to be comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable with that, don't do it. If you say, by the show of hands, who, who thinks that you know Star Wars is awful or something like that? You know, I just used an example of Star Wars, and you guys are not Star Wars fans, so it doesn't work. I said, scratch it, forget it. You know, it doesn't. It's not relevant. It's okay. Uh, you have to be prepared. The result of you giving power to somebody might actually not be what you want. So you just have to be ready. But when you do that, it shows to them that you care, and it shows to them that you want to bring them in. And that builds goodwill between you and your audience. Now, the fourth point that the authors articulate here is says, uh, conceptualize issues historically. You might ask the question, how does my message affect all of us? So if you're speaking to an audience that's broad and diverse, you might want to think of how what you're saying affects people who are not like you. And how, does, how has this issue been understood historically throughout periods of time by different people? Again, it will give you a perspective to understand because it will give, give you an idea of how to speak to an audience who's not like you, who doesn't have that same perspective on life, okay? Because remember, the goal of your speech is to be effective. And if you can't hold people's attention, and if you cannot give them something that they can grab onto, and if you cannot bring them into your speech, then they are getting nothing out of your speech, which means you have failed. You may have delivered the best speech ever, but you failed because you failed to connect with your audience. That's it. Failed speech is that. It could be written like a textbook, perfect, but you failed because you didn't connect with your listeners. And they didn't do anything, or you didn't communicate to them what you wanted to communicate. And in the end, the result of your speech is a big zero. So why did you stand there and do that? It accomplished absolutely nothing. You wasted that opportunity, you wasted that moment. So that's the idea. Um, even if your audience differs from you uh, in gender, in culture, in ethnicity, in, in language, in, in philosophical conviction, in religion, in anything that's out there, 
even if they differ with you, you could still make a connection with that audience. If you utilize these types of suggestions that we're just now talking about, of being sensitive, of thinking through, uh, how can I be clear? How can I be precise? How can I bring in the other perspective into my speech? It may not, it may just be a couple of sentences. That's all you need. But that will allow for that person not to tune out, but to stay tuned in. So there are ways of doing it, okay? And it's not as easy. So this chapter, you know, in this particular lecture hasn't been that simple to understand. Because now we're getting into really complicated stuff when we're talking about speech making. And so I'm expecting that some of you might utilize some of this material and might just not utilize some of what I'm sharing with you today. So I'm fully expecting on that. That does depend on your level of uh, learning, sophistication, and a desire. So it's really actually all up to you. If you really want to, um, to utilize this in your speech, I know you will.